will, you know, take us through the slides. Over to you, Doc. No, we can't hear you. Okay, all right, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll mute now. Hello. Over to you, Doc. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, boy. I don't know what's happening this morning. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Yes, we can hear you, Doc. All right, that's better. Right, where are we? So, uh, can you hear me now, yeah? So, good morning, everyone, and uh, sorry, and apologies for the uh, <clears throat> technical issues, as it were. Um, I made some changes uh, in keeping with um, the developments um, so far on COVID-19, uh, but as you know, the best laid plans <laughs> sometimes don't work as you expect them. However, we see what we can make of um, the previous presentation and uh, whatever questions that come out of that. In fact, I was hoping that we would be able to do it in an interactive way whereby, you know, people will have some burning issues. I know there are issues with the uh, testing uh, and of course the um, a vaccine that is imminent, you know, and all of that. I think these are more pressing issues and these are more important issues to discuss. So, but um, we'll go over the basics of what we've had in the past and then obviously um, see how we go from there. So, Charles, if you can go on with the slides, that'd be good. If not, I could try and see if I can share mine. You okay with that? I don't know. Right. So, um, cardiovascular disease in COVID-19, as you know, um, cardiovascular disease, cardio is the Latin word for heart, vascular <clears throat> is blood vessel, and the DX you see there is disease. So like everything else, you have um, you know, the heart and the blood vessels, the ones that supply blood to the body and the ones that take body away blood away from the other parts of the body and bring them back to the lungs and then get cleansed and then back to the to the heart and then back to the body that's how it rotates so there are heart conditions and they make uh so to speak people more vulnerable sometimes they say however there's no evidence to say that that is the case uh but we'll find out why next slide please so what i did was to put together a list of questions that people have asked me and answer them the best way I can at the point to, you know, in time when these questions were posed. There may well have been some developments since. But um, one of the questions I was asked was that, um, I have a heart condition. And does that mean because I'm, you know, I've got a heart condition, I am more um, likely to 
contract um, COVID-19 or not. Now, the honest answer to that is that nobody can tell you that because you've got a heart condition or because you've got problems with your chest, you're more likely, and if you're more likely, then you're likely to die from it. I can tell you that for free. Anybody, anybody can catch it. If you look at the way things have been happening, even the royalty, who you would say are fit, they do get, they do get it. The doctors who you say are okay, they get it. Sometimes it's the question of undiagnosed problems that would actually be brought forward by this COVID-19. So there's not any, you know, there's no indication to say that because you've got a heart condition, that means you're more prone. Obviously, if, if you have an immune problem, that is to say you have a problem where your immune system is not up to scratch, i.e. is not up to speed, you have an, you know, a chronic condition, then clearly you're more likely not to be able to fight off this infection if you catch it. But the technical issue here, which I want people to understand, is that everybody is vulnerable, whether you're royalty or pauper, whether you are a doctor or non-college graduate, you are vulnerable. Therefore, you need to protect yourselves. It's as simple as that. If you protect yourselves, you're more likely not to get it. The issue is if you do get it, the people who have got heart conditions, chest conditions, chronic conditions, are more likely to suffer more and are more likely to lose their lives on, 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 from that. I hope I'm clear. Yeah? Next slide, please. Right, the next one was, is the risk of developing, you know, severe symptoms of this dreaded disease similar for all patients uh, with a heart condition or are there any differences? Uh, obviously, as I say, the basics of contracting the infection is the same for all individuals. If someone is close to you and hasn't got a mask and you haven't got a mask and you're not, you know, socially distancing, distancing yourself, then clearly you're more likely uh, to get that because if this person is sneezing, coughing, and talking, that's it, most important, talking to you, you are likely to get the droplets. This is why it is important to get the mask because the mask will protect your nose, your mouth. So if you've got it and you don't have it and you don't know about it, because that's the key thing, the ones that do have the symptoms, they say, for example, I'm in a bus and someone is next to me and they sneeze, obviously I'll turn around and see whether they've covered their mouth. Again, if I see someone coughing, I'll, ask, I'll see whether they covered them, but with someone who hasn't got the symptoms, who's talking to me or having a nice, pleasant conversation, but yeah, from the saliva, from the spittle, they're actually passing it to me without me knowing it because they don't have the symptoms. These are the ones you worry about. Therefore, the need for uh, the, the mask. That's why it's important. Even with us doctors, every patient I go to see, I have a mask. And every three patients that I see, I need to change my mask. It just tells you that there are times when they said, well, if you know in the area where nobody is with you, you shouldn't wear a mask. Well, it's all changed now. Everywhere in the hospital, we all wear masks. Whether you're coming or going, we all wear masks. If you're coming in, you have to sanitize yourself and of course wear the, the mask. And when you're going out, you have to sanitize yourself and then you know take the mask off. Or no, the other way around, take the mask off and sanitize your hands and then go. So wherever you are, you definitely have to wear the mask. And it's important to remember that. So once the virus gets into the body, it goes through the nose, um, into the back of the throat, and that's where it starts you know, uh, multiplying. And then from there, it ends up in the chest. So it doesn't get to the stomach. So it doesn't get to the belly at all. It is something that is just on the airway. And I just wanted people to understand that. So it's the same for everybody. However, as I say, uh, you have to understand that this virus is playing tricks. It's a very clever virus. And therefore you have to be really, really you know, uh, diligent with it. You have to be really, really uh, uh, alert at all times. Don't, don't, don't drop the guard. If you drop your guard, you will end up, you know, uh, uh, you know, catching it, and God knows what would happen. Next slide, please. Yeah. yeah, it's not moving. All right, okay. Um, the risk, the risk. Uh, people who are at risk. Obviously, as I said earlier on, the ones who have got immune suppression, i.e. patients who've had uh, organ transplants, like the kidney transplant, the liver transplant, heart transplant, lung transplant, people with cancer, 
people who are being treated for cancer, like you know, having chemotherapy and radiotherapy, uh, people with blood cancer, likes of leukemia, lymphoma, people with heart disease, uh, they definitely obviously are more at risk than people who don't have that. Uh, the other people, uh, the category of people that do have that are also that high risk are uh, the elderly, you know, the frail and the elderly, obviously the pregnant women, you know, and those who have uh, comorbidities, the ones who have ongoing heart trouble uh, together with being old or being pregnant, you know. Um, you have people with um, arrhythmia, the irregular heartbeat. They're also people that you'd say are more prone. Children who are born with heart conditions, hole in the heart, you know, uh, these are all uh, children who are probably more prone to faring worse, not necessarily catch it. This is why I wanted to be clear. You can catch it, but you can fare better if your immune system is okay. Uh, but if your immune system is not good, then clearly you then would have uh, the possibility of it being worse than you. This is why you need to protect yourself from catching it in the first place. But there's no evidence that the virus affects the implants, i.e. Um, the, the, the ones that have like uh, replaced hips or knees. So those who've had hip replacements and knee replacements, those who've had pacemakers, those who've got um, uh, um, other uh, like uh, the, the hearing aids, the ones that are inside, the cochlear implants, or maybe some people who've had their valves replaced, they're not necessarily uh, more at risk because the valve is in there. It doesn't affect the valve as it were. Next slide, please. So I don't know if you know about this, but there's one condition called Brugada syndrome. Um, Brugada syndrome, there are three types. I don't need to go through the details for you, but I know for certain that in this particular situation, if somebody has got a temperature uh, of 39 degrees at the, against the background of Brugada syndrome, then clearly um, that could actually um, sort of be a sign of a really serious problem going on. Therefore, they need to be attending, you know, uh, the, the, the hospitals as soon as possible where they'll be checked out, uh, the temperature brought down and if there's an infection treated and if necessary admit them or if not send back home with the necessary medication. Um, there's the issue of uh, atrial fibrillation. This is what I've talked about, the irregular heartbeat. Uh, the question was whether they are at greater risk of getting this COVID-19. Um, the irregular heartbeat itself does not increase the risk of infection. I keep repeating that, it's very important to remember that. However, patients with the atrial fibrillation are older and they have other conditions uh, such as heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, and that makes them probably, uh, if they catch the, the, the disease, probably uh, they are more vulnerable and they will probably fare worse than somebody who's younger, who's not got any of the other comorbidities. Uh, so, it is obviously very important to protect yourselves, you know, uh, adhere to the, uh, the protective measures, the social distancing, the washing of the hands, and of course, um, making sure you avoid the crowds, you know, and, 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 and that probably would help you. And if you're taking your medications, don't say because of COVID, I'm not gonna be taking your medication. Well, you need to be taking them more, you know. And I think it's important to remember that, that if you have got a risk factor, then probably you need to be taking more uh, protective measures than somebody who hasn't. Next slide, please. So someone asked that they've read that the coronavirus can cause heart conditions. Uh, it can cause probably a heart attack or arrhythmia. Um, as a virus, it causes um, inflammatory effects. So there is a reaction. The virus goes in and the body uh, the, the brain gives the information to the, 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 the defense of the body, which is the, you know, the, the, the response you expect when uh, you invade it. So theoretically, uh, the virus can cause uh, a rupture of the fatty deposits in the arteries that surround the heart uh, that leads to what we call a, a acute coronary syndrome. Angina, you can hear about that. You know, that could happen. And uh, just yesterday, we had somebody that came in and uh, they had fallen down. They had a fall and they broken the hip, but then they complained of chest pain. And when we looked at the chest x-ray, we found out that 
this person has had COVID. So you can see how it happens. They come in with a fall, they've broken the hip, but we did the X-ray of the chest and we found out that this person has got COVID. So it gives you a different picture altogether. And, and what had happened was she complained of chest pain. And when we looked at it, we found out that she's got COVID and the COVID had led to the heart attack because it actually broke down these fatty deposits uh, that led to this uh, uh, coronary syndrome, we call it, which is angina. And so we then had to admit her on the COVID ward, but then treat her for the angina because the angina would soon take her life uh, compared to the broken hip. So the broken hip can be fixed later, but the heart, if it stops, then it cannot be restarted. So, you know, in essence, it is obviously important to remember that when you are invaded by a virus or a bacterium or a fungus or any other microorganism, there is a response that the body, you know, sort of develops. And so uh, it does uh, have this uh, complex which is created. So the antigen, which is the invasive uh, microbe, comes in into the body and that the body develops a response and that is the antibody. So that these two combined together, the antigen antibody complex, which is what you would see normally uh, when you do a blood test to see whether this person has been exposed to COVID-19 or any of the other bugs, you see. Um, you should definitely remember that if you follow, you know, the, 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 the recommended uh, me mechanisms and methods of preventing this thing happening, then clearly you should be uh, far more secure, far less, you know, in, 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 in at risk of, of, of catching this disease really. But definitely you should understand that there is the possibility of a heart attack happening and there is the possibility of uh, uh, pulmonary embolism. That's what they found out, that there is a, a, a PE, they call it, where there's a blood clot in, the, in between the lung and the heart. So that is another possibility because of the fact that it thickens the blood and it can block uh, the, 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 the cleansing of the, the, the blood. Because in the lungs, the blood gets the oxygen that it requires. So if it, there is a clot there that is preventing that from happening, then clearly uh, it causes problems with the heart as well and with the whole body. Next slide, please. So here we are again, the same you know sort of type of questions. Uh, patients who've got heart conditions and they do have diabetes as well as hypertension, are they at greater risk? Now, as I say, China obviously is where this thing started. Um, Significant proportion of those who have had that, this disease had comorbidities because they are older. So as the population ages, the more likely you are to develop you know, comorbidities or the issues like blood pressure, uh, diabetes. And uh, the 70 year olds and older, I don't want to be ageist, but that's where this problem starts. So mortality from the infection is quite high, definitely. Uh, there was an article linking uh, the blood pressure tablets, you know, the ACE inhibitors, the Ramipril uh, you hear about, uh, that if they take it, uh, they probably are more prone to it, but there's nothing to confirm that. And uh, all the big organizations, you know, European Society of Cardiology, British Cardiology Society, American Heart Association, all of these have actually said, you're better off taking your medication than not taking it. So I hope I'm clear. It doesn't mean because you are taking an ACE inhibitor, Ramipril and the other ones like that, that means you're more prone to catching COVID-19. It's completely not. You're definitely far safer uh, to take your medication as you would normally than not take it because people are saying that would make you more vulnerable. Not at all. Next slide, please. Uh, reports say that COVID-19 may induce myocarditis and pericarditis. Um, if you've had it previously, i.e. you've had previous myocarditis and pericarditis, are you more vulnerable to contracting it a second time? As I said, there's no evidence that an individual who's had that in the past uh, is at a higher risk than any other person who's not had it, you know, of, of, com of complications developing because you catch COVID-19. It is recognized, obviously, that some cases of myocarditis have a relapsing and remitting cause, which means it, it, it goes, it rotates, it comes and goes, it gets worse, worse gets treated, and then gets better. Uh, so there's no 
uh, indication up to date to, to show or to you know to confirm that indeed the virus is responsible for uh, the, the COVID-19 that actually affects the heart, which gives you myocarditis, you know. But of course, an acute inflammatory response uh, caused by an infection by the infection may worsen the cardiac function of anybody who uh, has got, you know, myocarditis or pericarditis, and that might lead to heart failure. Next slide, please. Somebody raise their hand. Yes, uh, Vanessa raised their hand. Yeah, raise their hand. Any, anything I can help with? <clears throat> no, sorry, that's a legacy hand. Oh, legacy sorry, hand, okay, right, okay. <laughs> right, people with heart disease, uh, are they more likely to die uh, than those without if they contract uh, COVID-19? As I say, age. Is, is a factor. And obviously because you're getting older, you will get more uh, of the conditions being revealed as it were, because obviously the, the vessels, the blood vessels, the, the arteries, the veins are not as elastic as they were, you know, plus of course, uh, we know these blood vessels are in all the organs, the kidneys, the liver, the eyes, the heart, the lungs, any of those. So if they're not as robust, they're not as elastic as they were, Clearly, you're more prone to getting conditions. You get it, more prone to getting uh, illnesses uh, that affect that affect uh, you, you, your health. So, therefore, you might say that could be um, a possibility that that would raise your chances of you uh, getting the COVID-19 and perhaps not surviving. But that is not directly linked to it. Definitely not. You know, people who had heart disease have been known to recover. I have seen. Uh, people who have been really unwell. When I say unwell, they were uh, tubed, they were put in a coma for like a hundred days, they recovered. Yet people who were well went into it and they had what we call a cytokine storm. This is the one, I don't know if you if you've heard that, but it's one wherein the infection is at its worst. It, it goes so rapid, so fast, that the organs begin to fail and then you begin to think well hang on where's that come from somebody who's been unwell for like all these years actually survived but then somebody who hasn't again it depends on how the body is and how it responds to it so it just goes to show you that it's not straightforward to say that because you are old and because you've got heart disease that means you're likely to die well statistics will tell you that but the reality is there are people who are older who have survived and people who are younger who have not survived i hope i'm clear next one please Right. Now he says, I know that I should not go to the hospital if I think I'm infected, but when should I seek, you know, attention if I have a pre-existing heart condition? Now, there is this new um, project that has been that has been launched, I think, somewhere down south, um, and I think I think it's been rolled rolled out to the rest of the country. If if you get the symptoms, you feel unwell, you obviously dial the 111 and they will direct you to the COVID 111 response team. They will sort of vet you, they'll conduct a vetting process, if you like, and they will then decide whether your illness is, you know, moderate, severe, or, you know, or, or, or mild. Now, obviously, if you moderate to severe, they will probably take your details and pass them across to the team uh with the ambulance crew where they will actually dispatch an ambulance to get you to go to hospital but they wouldn't just do that they will actually send you at a specific time and to a specific hospital so that you not only be observing the social distancing but you would obviously be there at the specified time and date and place for you, you to be able to be seen as you arrive without any further delay so that helps to actually um, send people to the areas where they need to be. If it is somebody that needs to be admitted, straight away they will come in and they will get admitted. If it's somebody that needs to be assessed, they would assess them and treat them. And if at that time when they're treating them, they find out they've actually deteriorated, they will definitely then admit them. If not, they will treat them, get them stable, and then send them back home. So that helps to stream. This is the important thing. It streams the patients with whatever they come in with, especially with that condition, and that helps a lot. That has brought down 
the figure, the R figure that you're hearing about, it's now between one and 1.1. 1 .1. It, it was at least 1.5 in the past few weeks. That's just because people have lowered their guard. So if you think you have it, first thing to do is obviously ring that number and they will definitely go through that process and they will decide what next really. But it does help. People talk about uh, ibuprofen, which is an anti-inflammatory drug or, or tablet. They used to say uh, it would cause, you know, you to be more vulnerable, more uh, likely to fall victim of the COVID-19. That has not been proved. That is wrong. Same as the ACE inhibitors, the ramipril we talked about. That has not been proved at all. So my advice to you is, if you don't have any contraindications, that is any issues when you take ibuprofen or uh, anodine or um, um, the they call it uh, diclofenac, uh, any of those, if you don't have any complications taking it, because people who have got ulcers might have problems, people who have got asthma, some of them might have problems because they start getting short of breath, then don't take it. Other than that, if you've got pain, then clearly you can take it. And that is not any proof to say that uh, when you take it, you are more prone to getting the COVID-19 or not. Yeah, next slide, please. Right, so yeah, that takes us to the next portion of the next segment, which is staying safe. Next slide, what you should do to stay safe. Next slide, yeah. Um, the, the measures, as we've been talking about, I mean, I've been saying this you know, all day long, obviously. What measures should you take to limit the risk of getting sick? You know, you know, if you have a heart condition or if you have a chest condition, clearly you need to follow the advice of the country where you live in. It is very important because it differs from one country to another. I mean, you can see for yourself that um, some countries go into full lockdown, some countries don't. You know, so it all depends on where you are and what it is the problem, and therefore follow that. Um, you could obviously avoid people who are sick. Like for example, with us in the hospital, uh, we don't choose to say because this one is a newborn, this one is five days or five years. This one is 95, this one is 100, this one is 20. We see everybody as a potential risk. So therefore, when we go and see people that are in the hospital, whether they come in well or unwell, we go with three things. We've got the mask on perpetually. We've got the gloves that we change after every patient. And of course, we've got the plastic apron. So it just goes to show you. Now, you might say, well, I see doctors, I see nurses that don't wear it well you should be telling them yourself that, look, you're putting our lives at risk. That should not be happening. So avoid the sick as best as you can. Again, remember the two meter or one meter distancing from one another is absolutely important. Remember, when you face the person, like you're sitting in front of the person, that's when you're more at risk if the person hasn't got a mask. If you're actually side by side with the person, like two meters or one meter away from the person, the likelihood of the person's saliva or spittle getting to your face is quite slim. So sit side by side rather than face to face. It is important that wash your hands as regularly as possible, as thoroughly as possible. Remember the 20 second rule and the water is nice, warm and soapy. This rule is really good. And as I say, if you're coughing, if you have the mask on, then it's there to protect you as well. If you're sneezing, again, you have the mask on. If you don't, then obviously you can do that in your elbow, sneeze into your elbow, cough, cough into your elbow. It is important that. If not, maybe you've got a tissue, you, you know, you wipe your nose and make sure it goes into the brain straight away. And after that, you wash your hands. You know, most importantly, avoid touching your nose, your eyes and your mouth. So these three things, social distancing, wearing of the mask, and obviously avoid touching of the face. These are the three things you mustn't forget. I'm not saying the other ones are not important, but those three are the ones that would definitely save you. And those three would be here for some time yet. Okay, next one, please. So yeah, we talked about the cleaning of the surfaces as well. You know, you have to be doing that regularly. So if you uh, are using the surfaces, the more you clean them uh, after use, the better it is for you. Uh, obviously, uh, as you can see, uh, the economy is dipping because of the fact that all the rents from the landlords <laughs> are now not existent because everybody's working from home. And, and that's the norm, you know, because the more people confluence together, the more likely 
there is the spread of this virus. You see what I mean? So even in hospitals nowadays, they make sure they alternate uh, the, 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 the way people work. So for example, if you work on a Monday, you probably will be working from home on a Tuesday and then the person who was at home on Monday will come on Tuesday so that you don't get the crowded places where this virus is, is, is likely to spread. That's, that's one way of doing it. So staying at home and working from home, if feasible, that is brilliant. If you've got a temperature, you've got a cough and you think you are sneezing and all that, then yeah, self-isolate. If you have been exposed to somebody, like example, I've got uh, family members who, where they work, uh, the people they work with have been uh, tested positive. So therefore they were given uh, the, the, the directives to say you have to stay home for two weeks, self-isolate. And if in that period of time, you then develop the symptoms, you need to be tested. And if you are tested uh, and, and you found to be positive, there is that track and trace system where you'd be told and obviously you need to self-isolate. And that's the only way we can get this thing under control, you know? Um, if, if, however, in the process of self-isolation, you feel unwell, then remember 111, the virus, uh, the, the coronavirus, COVID-19 111 crew would vet you and then send you to hospital if you require to come to hospital, simple as that. Yeah, next one, please. Right, this was an interesting question where the patient said, uh, I had the flu and I had the pneumonia vaccine this year. Am I prote protected from this virus? Now, people ask me these questions. Uh, there are two different viruses. The COVID-19 virus is similar to the flu virus, but there are four types of the flu, the, the, well, not the, the, the viruses that are the coronaviruses. The reason why they call them corona, as I think I said in the past, is because they've got a crown. So that's what distinguishes them from the rest of them. And there are four classes of them. There's the alpha, the beta, the gamma, and the delta. The alpha ones are the ones that give you this uh, flu, which we get, the cold, which we get, you know, uh, which people can ride and just go through it without much of a problem. The beta one is the one that you know we're talking about. That's the, the, the COVID-19 and the SARS and the MERS and the H1N1, H1F1 or something like that, H1N1 or something like that, yeah, that we had from China as well. So these are the more severe ones. But apart from that, it is also an RNA virus which then makes it similar to the HIV virus. And that is why it's difficult to get a vaccine for it. So it doesn't mean because you've had the pneumonia vaccine, it means you protected against the, 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 the COVID-19. They're two different viruses. And so, as I say, as we know, we are on the cusp of uh, starting or rolling out uh, vaccination, mass vaccination. That's what we're trying to do as it is uh, because we found a vaccine that is probably up to 90% successful and, and positive in the elderly above the 65 year old group. I want that to be clear. It doesn't mean the ones who are younger are not responding, but the, the best response so far is in the 65 and above group. That's what they found. But be rest assured that the flu vaccine and pneumonia vaccine are not the same as the COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide, please. Yeah. That question, as you know, I think we've answered all day long. Should you wear a mask to protect yourself from the virus? 100%, I'll tell you. In fact, I say 150. That's one of the, the thing that is here to stay. You know, we used to laugh at Michael Jackson, uh, blessed memory. When he used to wear his masks, we all laughed at him. But I tell you all, we all should be doing that now because that's the only way we can protect ourselves, especially when there is this fluctuation. In 1918, when the Spanish flu broke out, you had 500 million people, half a billion people that contracted this. And out of them, 55 million people died. You had three spikes. So we've gone through the first spike. Now we're going through the second spike. We pray that we don't have to go through the third spike because this is the winter. And in the winter seasons, things do not look rosy. So therefore, we need to protect ourselves by wearing these masks to prevent a third spike, because God knows what would happen if you get a third spike. Next slide, please. Can I take vitamins or the food supplements? And if so, which ones? Uh, do they protect against COVID-19? Well, of course, vitamins, the best way to take them 
uh, obviously is the natural form I, in the foods that we get them, like vitamin C you get in kiwi fruit, you know, and um, you know, in rhubarb and things like that. Vitamin D obviously we get from fish, from oil, from the sun. Uh, but obviously vitamin A we get from, uh, you know, uh, mango, from uh, carrots and things like that, uh, beetroot, the rest of it. Uh, the B ones, they actually, uh, they're naturally in the body and they form and sometimes they can be done, but they could be sort of, um, supplemented is it because we don't have you know the natural growing products and all that it is important that it's in, we need to supplement these vitamins now vitamin d which is what we know is associated uh, with covid19 and the severity especially in our race the afro-caribbean race uh, it is also very important to remember that uh, supplementing vitamin d is, is a vital ingredient in combating this COVID-19. The reason being that we have got less, we got more melanin, that is a substance that gives you the co complexion of the, the skin. So the skin complexion is determined by the amount of melanin that you have under it. If it's more, you're darker. If it's less, you, you're definitely lighter skinned, you see. But it has been found that people with low vitamin D levels are more prone to uh, catching or contracting the, the, the COVID-19. And if so, maybe worse. Now I can tell you this for free. Where I work, we developed this tool and, and one of the parameters that you would actually measure is vitamin D. But because of the fact that it's a given that all the, you know, the Afro-Caribbean people are probably more likely to be of either below average or average vitamin D, they're not even doing the tests anymore. They only do them if someone is unwell. So they advise you to take vitamin D. If it's very, very low, they can actually ask you to take supplements of up to 40,000 units a day. So 20 to 40,000 is what you would definitely need to if it's very low. If not, like I'm telling you, I myself, I've been taking it since January. Every day I take 1,000 units every blessed day without fail. So it's important to remember that that is something that we would need to help us get by, yeah? it is important that vitamin D levels are taken care of, i.e. you supplement them as best you can really. Uh, because if you look at the BMI, you look at the age, you look at the ethnicity, and you look at the comorbidities, and you look at the, the uh, vitamin D levels, these are all added together in that uh, book I'm talking about, this uh, risk assessment too. And if you score between nine and 13, uh, then you are low risk. So you actually uh, sort of scored from zero, one, two, three. And if you tot up all of that and you end up between nine and 13, you're low risk. But if you definitely score between 13 and 15, you're moderate risk. And anybody who scores above 15 is high risk. And therefore, if you are high risk, the employer should be redeploying you to somewhere where you are less at risk and less likely to actually come in contact with COVID-19 until uh, the situation allows for you to go back to your normal work without any punitive measures against you in terms of in terms of pay cut or in terms of uh, risk of you losing your job that's how it is so it's important to remember that vitamin d is vital to protection of ourselves against this uh, this uh, covid-19 next one please thank you ha good question this has been updated there have been two people I tell you, I, 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 tracked, I probably retract a bit. Usually when there is a, a pandemic uh, and people contract a virus, especially, you know, the ones in this category, you would expect um, sort of an immunity to last you between six to 12 months. That's ordinarily what it is normally. But in this particular instance, this virus has been found to be very powerful, really, really strong to the extent the immune, the immune response and the immunity that people, you know, sort of develop after they've, they've sort of gone through the COVID has been found to be sometimes less than the six months. Now, I'm not quite sure why that is, but I can only say that this is a very powerful and because it's a very clever bug, a very clever enemy, it does that. And that is why the vaccine becomes important. That is why you can't successfully achieve 
herd immunity. I'm sure you would have heard this term, herd immunity, where people are allowed to develop, you know, immunity. Uh, those who fall, you know, victim of it, and uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, die or maybe lose their lives, and then the ones who develop immunity. But the problem you have is because of the widespread mechanism whereby this 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 this, this virus is just spreading like wildfire. The only way you can successfully tackle it and probably get to a point where you say people have got herd immunity, which in, in actual fact, herd immunity means 60 to 70% of the population being immune against the, 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 the virus or any other agent. The problem though is you can't safely say you will do that without losing so many lives, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions, if you don't have a potent vaccine. And the potent vaccine should be 60 to 70% effective. Now, we are looking at possibly a vaccine that is coming out very soon, they say, which they say is up to 90% successful, you know, in the 65 year olds and above or older. Um, but we have to understand that um, it won't be readily available for everybody. So you're looking at probably January, February, when that would come, they can accelerate it. One thing that actually reassures me is that the UK, because uh, they are in uh, the EU so far, and we're still not gone yet, we're still in transition. Uh, the, the, before any vaccine or any treatment is actually approved in any EU state, all the EU member states have to approve it. Uh, that is one thing that reassures me that they wouldn't just come like in America, for example, they'll just get and say, okay, uh, the, the Center for Disease Control, the CDU, uh, will just do it. The FDA and the CDC will just do it, and that's that. No, here there's a robust mechanism in place for them to be checked out and all the effects to see whether they are, uh, you know, acceptable or not acceptable. And that is what reassures me. So once it comes out, I'm sure we'll be able to do it. But so far, we have two people who've contracted the virus again, having survived and actually got cured of it. And that happened within less than six months. So it's not very clear why that happened, but it has been known that indeed there are people who've uh, contracted it. And these two people were all in China. Next one, please. D Doc, we have a couple of questions that have come through. You know, yeah, come here. Yeah. Okay, so I'll stop sharing the screen for a moment. Yeah. And yeah. So one question is, uh, are there any side effects to taking too much vitamin D supplement? Uh, well, I mean, like everything else, you know, too much of one thing is, is good for nothing, that's, that's for sure. Uh, but as I say, because you don't know what level you are, whether you are low, whether you're moderate, whether you're high, yeah? I mean, imagine you are under the sun every day. <laughs> There's no chance of saying because you, you know, you've got the sun and you're getting the vitamin D going in or being reproduced because of the sun, it would be over or above. I doubt that very much. You safer to take the vitamin D within that level. As I say, 1,000 units is very safe to take. If you actually have had a blood test and the blood test has proved that yours is very low, the doctor himself or herself would recommend that you take 20,000 to 40,000 units. That is the norm, but that depends on your level. But because you don't know the level, your best bet is to actually maintain it at the 1,000 units a day. Is that clear? Thanks, Bob. Yeah, there's okay. another one. And then I'll, I know someone has raised their hands. I'll bring yeah, it up. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Someone is asking, is there enough vitamin D in seven Cs or pregnant supplement? Pregnant. Uh, no, I'm afraid not. The seven Cs could live a whole, is that what you're talking about? Well, the, the, this person didn't, you know. Okay, but seven, seven, C's, seven C's is just one thing. As I say, if you go to the chemist or the pharmacies, you will see it there, vitamin D on its own. And they're all, you know, as I say, they, you have the 20,000 units one, which you will take one tablet, 20, uh, one tablet in two weeks. So every two weeks. But clearly some people forget that. It's, it's very difficult. A bit like the, the anti-arthritis tablet, you know, the alendronate, they call it the uh, alendronate, uh, you take once every fortnight. People who are taking it will tell you that. But sometimes you forget, no unless it's in a blister pack where it's actually uh, put according to the two weekly interval, sometimes you tend to forget it. And that is why it's important to be able to take the one you take every day. 
So if you take the 1,000 units on a daily basis, you shouldn't have much of a problem. It's the same like you take any other tablet. If you were to take paracetamol, you take it four times a day, maybe the first thing in the morning. And, and so obviously, as you take that, you take the vitamin D, then it should be okay. But 1,000 units is very safe to take. And all my colleagues are taking it. And so far, well, thankfully, we're okay. So I recommend it strongly to everybody. Take the 1,000 units one. On a okay, daily basis. Yeah. Yeah, someone is asking, I was told by my GP that my vitamin D level is low, but I have not been prescribed anything yet. Can I ask them to prescribe something for me? Yeah, they, 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 automatically they should be. If they tell you the vitamin D levels are low, clearly they should be supplementing it because you'd be prone to, you know, body aches and pains and things and all that. And of course, God forbid you contract, you know, COVID-19, clearly you are at a higher risk of doing badly uh, with the vitamin D levels. This is something that has been found. And it's more important, especially in the African Caribbean people. So I'd urge you to get the GP to prescribe the vitamin D for you. Okay, I'll bring in gallery A50 plus. Yeah. You can mute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Someone with a device gallery A50 plus. Right, whilst we wait for the person to unmute, Doc, there's a question here about uh, if you could touch a bit of, about COVID-19 in children and, you know, what risk they pose since they've been asked to go back to school. It's interesting. I think I did, I did that. I don't know if I did it with you. I've done a, I've done a session on COVID-19 in children. I don't know if I did it with Khan or not. Yes, you did it with Khan. Right, okay. So it, it's a big topic. It's a whole topic. And uh, I think uh, uh, um, suffice to say that um, with children, clearly the, the cases are not as severe as uh, com compared to the adults. That's one thing. Secondly, the worst cases in the children are what we class as the, the PIMS, and it's it was PIMS, which was the the, the it was a, a syndrome, that, a collection of symptoms that were um, sort of observed or noticed or discovered by this doctor uh, Kawasaki, who sadly we lost uh, this year as it happened. So Kawasaki syndrome. If you see a child who's you know being unwell, uh, temperatures spiking up and down, you know, you give paracetamol and brufen. And still there's snotty, sneezing, coughing, and being weak, lethargic, painful joints. At the same time, they get like a strawberry tongue. If you look at the tongue, it's like a strawberry. And you look at the eyes, they're bloodshot, maybe red eyes and things like that. Then clearly that child needs to be taken to hospital, especially if they have abdominal pain, pain in the belly. Uh, then clearly they need to be taken to hospital. And as I say, so far this year, we've had two children where we had to uh, refer to the uh, Manchester Royal Infirmary, the Children's Hospital, uh, because they developed uh, the symptoms. So usually they're okay, they're fine. Uh, they can sail through it like they can sail through any other childhood illness. But obviously if you think that you're giving the paracetamol, the brufen, and they're not getting any better after three, four, five days, maybe a week, then clearly that's your cue to be checking, you know, the hospitals in order for you to be able to uh, get um, diagnosed. Especially if you notice that they're not drinking, they're not eating as they should, and the tongue is sore, it's red, you know, looking like a strawberry. The cheeks are red, the eyes are getting red, being weak and lethargic, clearly they need to be sorted out. But I, 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 in the main or chiefly, the children fare better than the adults. That's just a quick rundown. But if you want me to repeat that session, I can do that, no problem. Okay, th thanks, Doc. I'm gonna bring in Galaxy S8 Plus. Sorry, my question wasn't clear, but I meant um, the pregnant care supplements that you take for breastfeeding and the seven C's, they're all um, for breastfeeding, but they say that they have um, vitamin D. So I was just asking, uh, is, that, is there enough in there? Because it, it says that it's got a lot of um, different types of um, vitamins in the actual um, capsules. Yeah, I mean... And uh, vitamin the... D is one of them as well. Yeah, yeah, vitamin D is one of them. I, I admit, I agree with that. But as I say, uh, if what you're taking is not enough, then I'd say supplement it. This is what I keep telling people. People are taking like the, 
uh, what do you call them now, the multivites and things like that. Uh, obviously, you have the one which is a pound, and you have the one which is more expensive than that, really. Uh, but vitamin D on its own, it is important for us to supplement them. As I say, I take that one every day, and I've been doing that since uh, February. It's like okay, so when, is it okay if you are taking the 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 the, the breastfeeding ones, and then you can add on to? Yeah, that's right. That's what I recommend. Right. I recommend that you yeah, add okay. the one tablet, that one thousand, not the twenty thousand or forty thousand. Just the one thousand units okay. is very important okay. for you because you would actually see the difference once you start taking it. You would notice the difference, and you'd see for yourself that definitely, if you were getting colds that frequently, you might not get them as you are because that of the fact that you're topping up on the vitamin D. I, I know that for certain because I know people who've got severe back pain and they started taking the vitamin D and they ended up feeling better with it. But it's important Thank to remember you. that because of our ethnicity, we're more at risk of not uh, pr producing this vitamin D, which is important to combat, you know, as protection, as immunity against this COVID-19. And that's why I can recommend it to all people of this race to make sure you take that on a daily basis. It is important. There are published materials. If you want me to, I'll send them. You can read for yourselves uh, that vitamin D clearly needs to be. In fact, we, we wanted to be uh, uh, doing it on a regular basis. And they found out that the demand obviously surpassed uh, the, 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 the resources. And so it ended up in a situation whereby the demand and the supply is a mismatch. And therefore, we agreed then that everybody should be taking it. So all the doctors in my hospital that are off, you know, uh, 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 the, the black and ethnic minority, the BAME community, they're all bar none are taking it. And so far, we're okay. Thank God. They're okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Doc. I mean, there's right. a question if there is any link between low vitamin D and CVD. You know, bearing in mind, this person is also saying that usually when vitamin D levels are low following a blood test, you know, patients are given a loading dose and then asked to top up with, you know, off the shelf vitamin D tablets. I, I'm not sure whether there's a direct link. Um, I know for certain that, it, 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 you know, if you say vitamin D levels would give rise to CVD, uh, that's a cardiovascular disease, um, if you like, uh, worsening. I'm not sure there's a direct link. All I can say is that uh, vitamin D levels are of such importance that they form part of the risk assessment toolkit that we're all using. If you go to any of the GPs, they have got that. If you go to any of the hospitals, they have got that. In fact, I'll tell you for certain that there's a, a patient that came who... Um, very young, very able-bodied. Uh, and then uh, she came in because she had pain all over her shoulders, both shoulders. She couldn't, she couldn't just get herself up because of the pain. And uh, lo and behold, we investigated, we did x-rays, we did blood tests. And one of the blood tests we did was uh, the vitamin D levels. And I tell you what, we found out the vitamin D levels were very, very low. So for her, in her case, we actually asked her to take the 40,000 units a day for the two weeks in order to get it to that level we expect it to be before she can then taper it to uh, the 1,000 a day. That just goes to show you. Normally, the 20,000, you'll take two weekly, as I say, fortnightly. But because of the level that this patient had, we had to actually give her a loading dose. At the same time, take the 40,000 units a day not fortnightly, a day, so that it gets to that level by the end of the two weeks, and then taper it off where they can then be taking it either 1,000 on a daily basis or the 20, 40,000 uh, fortnightly after it would have got to that level that you know it's safe. But the back pain definitely got better within the two weeks, and, and, and now she's fine. You know, she's gone back to work. So, Doc, I know Jennifer has uh, raised her uh, hand. While she comes in, uh, just checking, uh, are the 20,000 you are in, or in 40,000, are they available on the shelves? Uh, they are, yes. I don't know whether you can get them over the counter, um, but you could definitely get them via the GP. That's 100% guaranteed. Right, okay. Jennifer, you can ask your question. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Doctor, uh, for the um, presentation. I just want to ask, 
And um, what, when you talk about units, what do you mean by units? Um, it's because, just the tablets, uh, the tablets, the tablet is, is in 1,000 and, uh, you know, 10,000, 20,000 and things like that. Is there, if you look at the, the box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I have um, a multivitamin thing here that says uh, five. Um, so the unit here is micrograms. Is that what you mean? Yes, that's right. I, I tell you what, just give me one sec. Give me one sec. All right, sorry. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, I was... yeah, yeah, I can I can see that. That's what I have. Oh, uh, and I take that on a daily basis. Yeah, so, that? yeah, I can see that, but it's and just... And if you look at that, can you see it? I'm um, not going to turn it upside down. Doc, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll take a photo and post it in the chat box. Yeah, no problem, yeah, that's yeah. it. Okay, it's just for me to understand... You, International yeah, there is, there, there is um, this one says that it has uh, 5 UG, and I've Googled what UG means. It says it's micrograms. Yeah, that's and right. It's milligrams as well. So I'm not yeah. sure which one. It... The one I'm taking is 25 UG that you mentioned. All right, yours is 25, 25 UG. 25, that's right. That's this, the 1,000. 1,000 units is 25 UG that. This is, it's written ah, there. OK, OK, yeah, that's so there. I can use that. So this is, um, if 1,000 is 25 UG, this is 5 UG, so that's, yeah, okay, I'll work it out. So that's five times more, yeah. yeah. Five times All right, okay. Yeah. All right, that, that, that's clear I'll enough. That. Thank yeah, you very much. Okay, okay yeah. no worries. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, right. Okay, bye. Okay, I'll, I'll bring Vanessa, can you unmute and ask your question? Hi there, thanks very much. My question is around asymptomatic contact. So if somebody's been in contact with someone the suspect of being COVID positive and they are asymptomatic, they're going to self-isolate for two weeks anyway. Do you recommend that they go for a test? And if so, when do they go for the test? The first day of contact or how many days later, or if at all? Do you recommend... Uh, is the do you recommend someone who's asymptomatic, you come in contact with them? So you come in contact with someone <laughs> that you suspect has possibly got COVID, you can't be certain, mm -hmm. and you're going to isolate for two weeks. Do you have a swab test anyway, or do you just self-isolate? Because I'm not sure, I'm a little confused as whether this is con contributing to false negatives, because people are either going too soon, not at all, or midway through. So. Do you recommend that they go for a swab anyway or just self-isolate for 14 days if they're asymptomatic? It's a very, very good question, but not a straightforward answer. I'll tell you why. You, you actually, uh, from the offset, you say asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. the, the A obviously is negation. I don't want to patronize you, but if someone hasn't got symptoms, the likelihood of you saying this person has got COVID is zero. And, and therein um, lies the danger. I yeah. want you to understand that. Therein lies the danger. So I cannot look at somebody, Joe Bloggs, on the street and say it's written on your face that you've got COVID. Oh, no, no, I don't mean like that. You know, like people say, well, I've heard somebody's COVID po positive and they've mm. come into contact with that person, but they have no symptoms at all. And the guidance is you go and self-isolate for 14 days. Do you have a test anyway, whether you're displaying symptoms or not? Now, if you do not have the symptoms mm -hmm. and you have the you have access to doing a swab test, then yeah, please do it. That okay. will help you, maybe reassure you, if you like. As I say, the way the virus, sort of the trajectory, if you like, the, the, the pathway of this virus is that it is most, that is it, most infectious on the first three, four, four days. By the time it gets to the fifth day, you find out that the, the, the level tapers off and it gets less and less and less. And that is why you see people will be symptomatic for a few days and then they develop their own immunity. They, they, they sort of just sail through it, they get better. And then by the end of the day, they don't even know they have it. But yet when you do the blood test, that's it. That's the important bit. When you do the blood test, 
it comes back as positive because it means this person has been combating, has been fighting with this virus without knowing about it. So for me, the best test is obviously is the blood test. The problem right. is the blood test is also one whereby the, 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 the microbe or the virus should be in the blood or in the body for at least a number of, you know, a certain period of time. And then the body has to mount a defense. So when the virus goes in, it's, it's an antigen. When the body responds to it, it's an antibody. And it's actually this complex, antigen antibody complex that you're looking for when you test the blood. So anybody who's been exposed to this virus and the virus has been there to a period where the body recognizes it and responds to it, you will see the antibodies in there. If that person uh, does not have antibodies, that means two things. Either that the, the amount that has gone in is not enough to actually cause them to mount a response. Do you see what I mean? Yes. Or yes. it wasn't there long enough for the body to recognize it and then mount a response. Right, okay. You see what I'm saying? So, yeah. so, so yeah. You, could, you, could, you could actually test yourself. That is not a problem at all. No one can tell you don't test yourself, no. If you're symptomatic, more so than not. If you're not symptomatic, then isolation might just be what you need. I mean, at the end yeah. of the day, I can tell you my own story myself. Personally, I work in a department where there's, well, maybe 100 people, and we get people coming in on a daily basis. I'm actually at the forefront there, you know, conveyor belt head of it. And what tends to happen is, I remember this clearly, I have 10 people that we sit in the same room together. And out of these, five of them have actually tested positive. So I was like, oh my God, I am definitely one because we eat together, we, you know, we talk together, even without masks sometimes and the rest of it. And uh, they said, do a swab of the nose and the mouth. And I said, I tell you what, you talked about false positive and false negative. Yes, indeed. There is always that in any experiment you do. But then I decided when the, uh, the blood test came on, I decided I needed to do it. And I tell you what, Lo and behold, I was shocked beyond belief that I am negative. There's no antibodies detected. So what I then found out is that, hang on, is this good for me or not? You know, on, on one side of the coin, you say it's good for me because clearly maybe I have a good Im immune system. That is why I have not, you know, been, been able to uh, have any detection of the virus on me. Or maybe it's because of the protection that I've been using, i.e., I make sure my mask is on. If I was the only one wearing the mask, I was the only one who would actually make sure I don't wear my CVs in work. I take them off, I put my scrubs on. And then when I take my scrubs off, I make sure I would have washed my face, my hair, my ears, my arms up to the level where the scrubs are every day on a daily basis. As long as I'm in there, by the time, I would take me about 15, 20 minutes to do that ritually. And that uniform leaves that place and goes straight into the into the uh, uh, washing machine and washed at 60 to 90 degrees. So perhaps that's what it is that would have actually protected me against that. Or it maybe my immune system is quite good. That is why that has happened. Or maybe the amount that I've been exposed to is less to the extent where my body has been able to cope with it and did not need me to actually have any antibodies produced. Can you see yeah. where, where I'm coming from? Yeah, I'm a frontline worker myself, but mine's pretty okay, my immune system. Brilliant, that's good. So you must be doing something good, but I advise, yeah. please, if you're not taking vitamin D, please take that. And if you're wearing your uniform, please don't wear it home. Don't take it from work to home. You know, take it off, put it in the bag, and then put it in the washing machine. That would help a lot, especially Thank when you. people are asymptomatic. But that's really yeah. good. I enjoyed that. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, all right. Okay, Doc, a, a few more questions. Yeah, so one is, what is the dosage of vitamin D recommended for children? And another person is saying, I'm taking vitamin D3, you know, 10 UG. Is that the same you're talking about or do I need to take another one? Yeah, this is, this is 25. 25 UG. Right, okay. Yeah, that's the, the 1,000, you know, uh, units. Now for children, obviously, uh, I think, now, I don't know whether they give it to them routinely, the children, uh, for the COVID. I'm not sure uh, from that point of view in terms of um, prophylaxis or maybe prevention. I'm not sure whether there's a children's dose, uh, but um, 
we don't tend to use it routinely. I was just looking up the, the, the facts whether there is there is any in the in, in, in the children's side of things whether they need to be using it. I think there is uh, in fact what I see here by mouth is um, 400 units daily. That's what I see on the BNF, 400 units. Yeah? Okay. Okay. 400 but... units is what I see on the BNF. Okay. Before I bring in Kasim, there's a question about, do you know what the criteria for the COVID vaccine will be? There are so many conspiracy theories about the vaccine, such as chips being placed in them to trace people, that they will give it to older people and ethnic minorities so that they can continue testing. You know, how do we debunk such myths? Well, <laughs> i tell you what, a, I'll ask the same question to the, the audience and see. Now, we have this, you know, uh, uh, um, conspiracy theorists galore. Uh, you know, there's no harm in being, uh, if you like, not a pessimist, but maybe someone who's uh, cautious. Yeah, I understand that. I agree with that. And obviously, if you're not sure about something, then clearly don't go into it full blown. Fine. The problem, though, is would you say if the vaccine becomes available? And because we are not very committed to it, if we are omitted from taking the vaccine, would you say that's racism or not? Now, I wanted people to I think clearly about it. it. Think Ooh, very it. carefully that they omit the struggling. African Caribbean race from taking the vaccine. Would that be racism or not? See, I want people to understand something. As I said, the EU, is very, very strictly regulated in terms of vaccines. And I can tell you this for free, that the 27 or 28 member states will all, bar none, have to approve the use of any vaccine. That is one. So as long as we're still in the EU, definitely they would have to go through these very, very rigorous tests in order to make sure that nothing comes up. In fact, most of the time, England, and the EU are the, 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 the slowest in terms of responding, in terms of accepting any kind of a discovery, if you like. The Americans and the rest of them, they're always in the lead. And as we can see, this is what is happening, but ours in the UK and of course the, 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 the EU, there are uh, very, very strict uh, measures in place in order to make sure that this goes through all the necessary uh, uh, phases. The other thing I wanted to tell you is now, I don't know if you'd be happy for me to say that, but it's actually up in social media. The first recruit I repeat, the first recruit for this vaccine trials or research is a Caucasian, is a colleague of mine. And uh, if you look at the BBC, watch the BBC, you would see that he's in the front line. They actually, have, they actually were the first ones to volunteer to actually take this vaccine. So for people to tell me that there is eggs, there's chips and things and all that, well, you might as well say uh, the water we drink from the bottles have got chips and things and the rest of identifying people, identification purposes. I really do not want us to be doing that kind of thing. Yeah, you have to be protective of yourselves. That's good. You have to be hesitant or cautious. That's fine. But please, 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 let's not be uh, sort of uh, injurious to, to one another. It doesn't make any sense for anyone to tell me that they will put chips there to identify people and all that. That is absolutely out of this world. I can't even respond to that. that, that that's, that's one. Secondly, we need to be more in favor of this thing going on because we are worse affected. Remember this, if you look at the, the baby community, we are worse affected. Therefore, we need to be leading this. We need to be making inroads, yeah? Because of the fact that we are worse affected. Again, you look at things like hypertension, diabetes, and strokes and things like that, clearly we're worse affected. Therefore, if there is a way of finding out a cure, of finding out a way of bringing this down, you know, to the level where we know it's acceptable, then we should be leading this. Not, you know, espousing or, you know, proposing that, oh, hang on, they're going to take care of us, they're going to I mark us, they're going to do this and that. That is absolutely too far-fetched. I think we need to be interested in this because it's in our own interest. Sorry, Mel, can I just interject there? And I think just to make it clear, I think people do want to be put forward, but I think BAME people especially feel they've never been put first for anything before. 
but we've also never been through a pandemic before. And that's where people's reservations sit. We have I, never I, been at the forefront yeah. of anything. I, so I appreciate that. that. I appreciate that. But so far, I don't think, you see, the other thing that people have is that this thing is uh, mandatory. That's the understanding I get. Now, this is far from that. This is purely on a voluntary basis. And besides that, before you get recruited, this is it, because before you get recruited into these research and, uh, and, and, and trials, you have to actually, I think, fulfill some certain criteria. And if you don't fulfill the criteria, you would not be uh, recruited or enrolled. It's as simple as that. So it's not just as plain sailing that way because I'm a black person or because I'm Afro-Caribbean descent uh, or, you know, or ethnicity and all that. Therefore, I'm straight away that. Right. Maybe uh, it's not, the <clears throat> sorry, it's not been the case where um, people were put forward, our own people were put forward. Maybe not. I understand that, I appreciate that. But what I'm saying is there are Caucasian people who are involved in this thing. And as I said, the first recruit is a Caucasian. It's a friend of mine, it's a colleague of mine, and um, they're doing quite well, as it were. Whether there's any hidden agenda or not, I can't support that. I can't see that because I know for certain that if at all you are going to go through something, it wouldn't be something like this. You know, clearly not. I don't think that's the right thing to do. I, I clearly hope that we will all join the forces together to try and get this thing because at the end of the day, it will benefit us most compared to the others. Remember, we are the ones that are worst, you know, most affected. And that's why it's important to remember that this is for our own benefit that we need to be engaged. We need to be involved in getting this thing forward. Okay, Doc, one more question and then I'll bring in Kasim. So, you know, someone is saying a few years ago, my doctor stopped giving me vitamin D and said the government has said doctors could no longer prescribe it and patients should buy theirs from the shelf. Is that true? Uh, well, I you see, I am not a GP. I'm a hospital doctor. I can't for certain tell you that um, the doctors have been instructed not to prescribe it. I don't know why, because vitamin D on its own is not something you prescribe just like that. It's a specific drug that you prescribe only on specific occasions or specific illnesses. So I don't know if anybody would tell you we're not going to be prescribing it. I know that uh, because of the fact that they use paracetamol, you know, and brufen really that rampantly, there are groups that are exempt. So a way of saving money, because it's like 25p, not that, now it's like 75, one pound 50, if you go to the shops because of the fact that people have been panic buying and all that, and it's not been there. But paracetamol and ibuprofen, I know for certain that they have, uh, issued directives to say that people can stock that off the, the, the chemist or off the, the shelves or even the, uh, the, the co-ops, the, you know, the quick saves and all that, you could actually get that. That is why they discourage people to actually prescribe it in the hospitals. But what concerns vitamin D, I don't know anything about that. I've not heard that. And certainly in my hospital, that is not the practice. Thanks, Doc. Uh, we, we have a neonate consultant here. She wants to say a few words about, you know, the vitamin D for children. Yeah. Ngozi. Um, hi, Charles. Well, no, I, not really. I just put something in the chat because I, I, I heard the question about whether you can give it to children. And so I work with children. So I just um, put in the chat that you can use Abidec. Abidec has the required um, amount of vitamin D for children, which is a 400 international units. So if you well, give, Ab give you the right dose. I'm glad, Doc. Thank you very much. <laughs> Fine. I just put it in the chat. And goes, what's the okay. surname, sorry? Eddie Osage. Oh, right. Okay. I don't think we've met. No, I don't think we've met. All right. Well, you tell the, the, the boss there. Tell him you're talking to his senior. He knows me very well. Um, I'm the boss. <laughs> uh, all right, okay. <laughs> You're the boss, that's right. I'm about to you. <laughs> Thanks for that, Ngozi. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to also, I've been listening to the discussion about the, 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 um, the vaccines, and I know that people are really worried. Um, and I talk about vaccines a lot because I work with children, so I'm always having to speak to their parents about vaccines. And the, the fact is that... Um, this pandemic has, has really showed us that we need to look after ourselves on lots of different levels. So with the vitamin D that um, we've been talking about this afternoon, 
Um, I know there's a lot of fear and it's because of the, the this, this, these fears are founded because a lot of bad experiences that black people have had over the years. So we know about experiments that they did about syphilis that has caused us to um, be distrustful of um, processes that are there sometimes to protect us because we know at times they've taken advantage of black people and people who perhaps can't speak up for themselves. Um, but I feel I'm, I'm torn in a sense because I know that um, when you don't trust people, it's difficult for you to put yourself forward, to put things into your body. But uh, as a medical professional who has seen the good effects of vaccines, I can only support this vaccine in a sense. Um, I have seen in my career, when I started out as a doctor, um, I saw babies who had limbs amputated in the UK. This is not in Nigeria, here in the UK, because they had meningitis B. Um, I haven't seen that for the past five years because we have a vaccine. So if you speak to parents who've had children who have either died or have no legs and no hands, that I wish, it would, they, it would they have taken it if there'd been a vaccine? The answer is absolutely yes. And you can only speak about this from a position um, if you're affected by that disease and you see the bad effects of the disease. Um, so as a medical profession, I feel really torn because I understand the concerns of the community and it really breaks my heart when I see all the misinformation that's flying around the internet and social media about vaccines when I know the good things that can come out of vaccines. So maybe what we need to do is to have a few people who people respect and trust in the black community that go forward in maybe the second wave. <laughs> <laughs> and have the vaccines to, sh to show that it's safe, to show that it's safe, to prove that it's safe, because um, it has had a disproportionate impact on the black community. So we're more affected, we die more. And now that we have a vaccine, we don't want to have it. We can't, um, we cannot have it both ways. Th th thanks for that, Ngozi. I'm going to bring brilliant, it up Brilliant, Doc. I'm so pleased you came out with that. I, I didn't want to go through the gruesome past, like the syphilis and all that. Now, I just to, to uh, uh, echo what uh, Doc has said, if you remember, I think about 15 years, I mean, she, uh, uh, you know, Doc there being a, a pediatrician, obviously a neonatologist, would obviously echo this. Uh, there was a, a, a doctor who actually uh, um, advised that taking the vaccines, the MMR vaccines, uh, all together uh, were probably a source of um, linking it to autism. And so obviously a lot of people, a lot of parents actually backed out of it. And 10 years later, maybe 15 years later, there was this epidemic that broke out with Manchester at its worst affected you know, level uh, regarding uh, measles, it just broke out. So we actually, at the other end in the hospital, we actually felt that it was really bad. Same as the positive side of things where uh, we had the vaccines being taken and therefore things like epiglottitis, the swelling of the throat that is actually uh, causing problems whereby people can die of that, children can die of that. Uh, because of the vaccine uptake uh, is definitely something you don't see nowadays, you know because of that. So it's important to remember, I know the anxiety, you know, we've all been through that. We've seen what they've done to us in the past. But because of the fact that we are disproportionately affected by this, uh, this dreaded illness, and because of the fact that, you know, we are more vulnerable, I, I think it's advisable to probably be, uh, uh, you know, focused to say that, you know, at the end of the day, we, if this thing works, we'll probably be more, uh, it will, it will be beneficial to us compared to our other folks, not being racist or not being, you know, uh, 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 xenophobic at all. But it's important that, you know, we need to look at, look after ourselves and we need to probably be more proactive rather than being, uh, you can be cautious, yeah, but you need to be more proactive really, rather than being, you know, pessimistic and being in denial that this is there and it's there to stay. It's as simple as that. You know, COVID is not going away like that. This is now the new norm. And therefore, we need to be wanting to get this thing under control as best we can for our own interest. Call it selfish, but we need to be promoting this, you know, in our own uh, uh, society, in our own communities for us to get this going. 
Thanks, Doc. I'm going to take those two questions and then we can wrap up. So, Kasim, can you unmute? And then we also take Jemima's question. Those two questions and then... Kasim, we can't hear you. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, uh... This is about the hubs, which I know about things which uh, I've I've uh, I've seen other people using in the past. You know, which helps uh, people's well-being as well. Uh, thing is, which I know the cloves. You know, the small cloves. Cloves is good as well to to help in COVID as well. You know, attacking COVID. So what you do with the with the cloves, you. You put the cloves in water, water, I mean, you boil it. You put inside lemons inside. You mix it with some, uh, there's certain leaves, uh, which I don't know what they're called. Uh, called mint, yes. You mix that as well. And then you mix the garlic as well inside. And then you leave it to boil, you know. And when it boils, leave it to cool down. And then you drink that all the time. That helps as well. And the next thing again, you can catch like, a, say, watermelon, big watermelon. Cut it up, all of it. Brind it all, make it like juice, all of it. Bring it on the saucepan, I mean, on the cooker, boil it. Not too much, let it boil a little bit. And then cut like two lemons inside, squeeze lemon inside. And let it, you know, steam, let it cool down. And then you can use it like in the mornings or whatever, anytime. You drink like a glass every day. It's good for you as well. And another thing, the lastly, what I have to say, uh, you catch cloves of gloves, gloves, uh, garlic, say like seven or six. You cut them into small, small pieces, you know, like little, little ones, small, small pieces. You put them on the spoon. You get a glass of water. You drink it either with milk or a glass of water. You do it once in a week or whatever you want to do. But it's good for you as well. It helps to kill bacteria in in your belly, it helps as well to kill bacteria who cause cancers in the thingy in your belly. Say like ball system and things like that. You know, it helps you as well. And uh, yeah, that's the that's, those are the things which I've seen people using them, and they would really help them. You know, yeah. Doc, any comments? Uh, yeah, thank, thanks, Kasim, for raising that. I've had such yeah. similar things, but over to yeah. you, Doc. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, as I say, I, I wouldn't frown on anybody trying to use, uh, you know, uh, if you like, um, herbal remedies. I don't, as I say, you just mentioned the uh, cloves. They have medicinal values. We know that, you know, if you look at it, you talk about garlic. We know about the cardioprotective, you know, values. We know that. You talk about lemon, you know, talk about lime. We know about uh, that being rich in vitamin C. And of course, if you've got a cold, you've got a flu-like symptoms and all that, vitamin C is what you're supposed to be, you know, uh, um, sort of stacking up on and, you know. And, and so, there's, as I say, what I don't want people to think is, is, is that th th there's this theory, this myth, that if you take the cloves and the garlic and the lemon and you boil it and put the mint and all that, you are then, uh, if you like, COVID protected. And I want people to just understand that that is a fallacy, that is an untruth. And please, please, please don't rely on that. Yeah. If you do not undertake the, protect, the protective mechanisms, what is actually required of you, your social distancing, you know, distancing, your, your, your masks, yeah? And of course, you know, uh, uh, washing of the hands, you know, the surfaces and all that. And if you are, obviously symptomatic, then obviously self-isolate. If you're getting worse, you know, speak with the 111. Uh, 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 that is no way to be replaced by these, you know, concoctions or the policies that you can see. I don't have a problem with that. You can do that. That's what you want to do. That's fine. But please, please, please don't think because you've done that, you should not, not, not then protect yourselves. And that's what I want to be clear. It, it's the take home message. You can do what you want, this is your body at the end of the day, but, but I would advise strongly that please, please, please protect yourselves as best you can. If you add the value of the vitamin C's and the cloves and the garlics, then that's fine. That's okay. No problem. 
but as a medic, I would not necessarily advise you to lower your guard and uh, rely wholly and solely on these poultices or these herbal remedies. It just wouldn't work, simple as that. Thanks, Doc. The final question from Jemima. Can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Oh, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Thank you, Doctor, and for everyone who have made their contribution today. Uh, uh, my issue is still concerning this vaccine. I think I want to say that it's not really because uh, maybe some, you know, some of us Blacks may not be willing to accept the vaccine. But you know, unlike other vaccines, maybe like the MMR and like the, I mean, the, the, uh, um, the polio vaccines and so on, you know, we will just be told that maybe the side effect may just be fever, which you can just follow up with paracetamol a day or two, and that is it. But for this COVID vaccine, and we are actually, you know, getting to know that it could, and, uh, and mutate our genes and it will cause other, you know, terrible side effects. And then, you know, we, I mean, one now begins to wonder what do we do or where do we tilt to? Um, do we, you know, accept it, you know, since we don't really know what it's, it's going to do and if it's going to affect us permanently, you know, is it really worth having? And another thing is that when we have this MMR, we see where that this vaccine will help, you know, that in case you now suffer from, or in case you now come across that uh, disease, that you know, it will not affect you, you know, badly. But with this COVID, I would have actually expected that if you have suffered from it and somebody has been positive, that that person should be immune. But if that is not the case, then what will this vaccine still do for us? All right. Thank you. Uh Thank you for the question. Yeah, it's a good Thank question. Uh, very, very good one. Now, one thing I can tell you for free is that we, I think I mentioned this earlier, this herd immunity. For you to declare herd immunity, you need to have 60, 70% of the population uh, to be immune. You can't say you will achieve that. There's no chance of you achieving that if you do not have a viable vaccine. So the vaccine goes in tandem with the herd immunity. Otherwise, there's a lot of lives that will be lost. It's as simple as that. I don't know if I'm making any sense. What concerns the immunity, as I say, from, as I say, historically, most of the viruses that we come across, uh, you know, we know that if you have immune, like for example, the Ebola virus and all that, we knew uh, and from experience, we know that six months to 12 months is what you'd expect to be the case. It has not been proven to be the case with this virus, this COVID-19. It's probably a different kind of virus. We're still learning, remember, it's less than a year old. We're still learning from this. Now, you can decide, maybe I don't want to get on board. I'll wait until everything is finalized. If you're in that group, then fine, go ahead and do it. But my advice to you is that, as I say, I'm torn between you know, supporting and not supporting because of what has happened in the past. However, I can only tell you that you cannot expect to achieve herd immunity without 60, 70% of the population being immune. And the only way that you can feasibly think that would be a successful thing to, to undertake is by having a viable vaccine. Remember, if the vaccine is even less than 50% or 50% successful, it can't guarantee that you would achieve that status of herd immunity. Yeah, and if it is as we're finding out that is 90% or so successful in the uh, older than 65 year olds, not in the young. And it's, it's funny how the understanding was uh, with the herd immunity, it was more uh, above 65, you were just left and that's it to, 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 to die and things like that. You know, but now the ones who are more uh, responsive, who are actually responding to the vaccine are the ones who are 65 and above. It's very ironic and very, very interesting how that's played out. But I can only suggest to you that think long and hard about it. Nobody knows what the long-term side effects would be because this is a new thing. And there's no way of telling until that time would have gone, you know, passed by for you to actually reflect on that. But as far as I know, historically, the other vaccines that we've had in a similar nature have always been, you know, uh, as I say, uh, useful, successful, and with the side effects that you can actually tolerate and, and, and live with. And something like, you know, sneezing, coughing, uh, you know, heavy arm, painful arm and things like that, muscle ache and the rest of it, 
you get when you take the flu jab. That's what they expect, you know. But to say that the genes and all that will be taken the rest of it, I don't know about that because, as I say, there's no proof that has been presented to me or provided that I can say, yes, I can cite that this is what has happened. So, as I say, for you to get herd immunity, you definitely need a viable vaccine. And there is one they're saying, and as I speak, it's not even been rolled out yet. We're looking at probably uh, another month or two, maybe three, maybe longer for us to actually uh, get that. And I can guarantee you one thing, that's the last thing I'm gonna say. If at all, once they're doing it, they actually experience some uh, unacceptable side effects, I guarantee you they will have to bring it to a halt. They will stop it, investigate further, and then take it from there. It's been done before. And I don't think this will be any different. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Doc. Any final words as we wrap up? Well, <laughs> final words. I, I, I'm, I'm grateful to all of you for giving me the opportunity uh, uh, to talk to you again. I must be doing something right that you want to be hearing my voice. <laughs> but remember, we're, 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 we're in, in this together. We're all in this together. Remember, there's no, for me, there's no discrimination whether you're rich or poor, you, you are uh, celebrity or sovereignty or whatever. Clearly, the, the, this thing is indiscriminate. This COVID-19 is indiscriminate. And remember, it's a very clever and yet powerful enemy. So we need to rise to it. Please, 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 and pretty please, do not let your guard down. Don't think that people are being punitive to you when they tell you to stay home and try and avoid crowds and this, that. It is for your own safety. Yeah, remember, the rules are there for, to help you. Simple as that. Protect yourselves. Nobody can do that for you. You will have to do it yourself. You can say, purely from a point of view of being selfish, but look after number one. Please, 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 it is important. The reason being, we are disproportionately affected by this dreaded enemy. And therefore, we need to raise the bar. We need to be more alert. We need to be more meticulous. We need to do what we need to do in order to prevent any avoidable or necessary deaths. Please, 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 it is important. Look after yourselves and the rest will come later. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot, Dr. Kamara. So thanks everyone for making time and you know staying on. As you can see from the chat box, we have part two of the Black Skin session. You know this Thursday evening with Dr. Chrissy Apia, and I'm looking forward to many of you joining us. But as Dr. Kamara has offered, we hope to have him back to do you know a specific session on on you know children. But Dr. Kamara, we're really grateful for your time and Thank whenever you. we you know, call on you and short notice, you yeah. make yourself available. Thank so you. next Saturday as well, it will be focused on women's health. We're going to have, you know, the friend of Dr. Eddie, Eddie Osagi, you know, that will be Dr. Patrice, uh, you know, Arthur, gynecologist, she'll be talking about fibroids and, you know, other related conditions, but it's all women's health. So don't forget Thursday evening, 8 p.m., Dr. Chrissy Apia will be with us to carry on with the black skin conditions and take all your questions, anything dermatology. And then on Saturday, it's, you know, uh, women's health. And then the following one, it, it will be, you know, cardiac consultants that Dr. Ngozi is kindly, you know, uh, found for us. So, you know, enjoy the rest of your weekend. As Dr. Kamara has said, keep safe, hands, face, space. And, you know, make sure you get your vitamin D of the shells, you know, either the 1000 IU or the 25 UG and, you know, look after yourself. Thanks, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you on Thursday. But also on Tuesday, we have our physical activity and the nutrition session. So don't miss, on, don't miss out on that 630. We look forward to seeing you. Doc, thanks once again. And Thank you. See you soon. All right. Bye. Bye.